This is Terry Howell from the Talk Back Fans Podcast, and you're listening to the Barbecue Central Show with the incomparable host, Greg Rempe. Start the game! Let's go! I'll do it live. Do it live! I can, I'll write it and we'll do it live! So to get that perfect barbecue, you use wood. Are you sure you say whatever? We put the lighter fluid on, strike the match, and... Oh. Should we call the fire department? That might be a good idea. This is a show that talks about all things important to the world of barbecue and grilling. Originating from the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame city of Cleveland, Ohio, the barbecue capital of the North Coast, North Coast, points east and west as well. I am your aforementioned program host, Greg Rempe. Happy to have you right here on your Tuesday live fire fun and frivolity show. Let's start making that a thing. That's what I want. The new say it used to be we'll do it live. Before that, it was get in the smoke. The new catchphrase of the show, aside from cats pissing all over my house, and I do have an update about that I'll get to here in a second, maybe. But the new catchphrase of the show, I want to be the live fire fun and frivolity show. That's what I want. That would look great on a t-shirt. Barbecue Central show, logo on the front, and on the back, it would just say live fire fun and frivolity show. And people would read it and go, what the hell is that all about? And they would perhaps be forced to ask you, what does your shirt mean? And then you could then... Then, then, you could infect them with the Barbecue Central show knowledge and tell them to subscribe to the podcast at the very least, watch the show at the very most live every Tuesday from 9 to 11. Anyway, I've gotten way off track. Happy to have you aboard here. If you want to jump in on the show tonight, here's how you do that. You can get in touch with the show by calling 216-220-0966. Email Greg at the BBQCentralShow.com. On the Twitter and Instagram, at BBQ Central Show. Everything else you want to find out about the show can be found at the main website, thebbqcentralshow.com. And here's what's happening. Coming up in about 12 minutes from now, it's the second Tuesday of the month. And in the first hour, that can only mean one thing. A visit from Meathead from AmazingRibs.com for joining us. Meathead is already on fire telling me that he knows for a fact that I have stopped playing his walk-on music, which is a song that he has penned himself and paid for a real live professional singer to sing. Unfortunately, in my estimations, it's one of the worst songs I've ever heard. So I want a song that motivates, that really gets us going, ready to rock and roll, all that good stuff. You can't hurry ribs while the fun play on words. Isn't what I would call a walk-up song or an intro song or get... A song that gets you pumped up is Cell Dweller's Switchback that I play right before. That's the song that I'm playing as I come into the show. When I say, hey, welcome to the fun and frivolity show. That's the rock and roll music that's playing. The bumpers that I have here on the show, that gets me jacked up. That's why I have them. You Can't Hurry Ribs is fun, tongue-in-cheek. I feel a little bad that you paid for that. And if I forget to play it every time, every month, unless you threaten that you're never going to show up again, I'm probably not going to play it. Uh That's why. Also because I forget. But Meathead will be here in the first hour. Never fear. Then we'll move to the second hour. Oh, baby. We got it all locked and loaded. 14 pass the second hour. Hardcore carnivore founder. Live fire expertise. Jess Pryles rejoins the show. Purveyor of fine rubs and gear. College student. Graduate student, maybe. 
And plenty to talk about with Jess, including the just keep flipping method that I don't, I think she would own up to the fact that she like, she didn't find or is the founder of this method. I remember hearing a, oh, I, I won't even get into it, but we'll be talking about that as well. Cause she's really been promoting the just keep flipping method. So we'll talk about that, of course. And then coming out of the bullpen, first timer to the show, a host of his own podcast and what they call a chef's liaison for a company an hour south of me in Wooster, Ohio, Brian Schaff from Certified Angus Beef. Oh, there's a burgeoning relationship here coming, perhaps, if not, nothing ventured, nothing gained. I'll still remain doing my fun and frivolity when all of the social media influencers are invited to Wooster to go to their beef shenanigans and I stop down and take a selfie in front of the sign and then drive away with my tail between my legs. I love doing that. I would miss doing that actually. So that's how the show lines up for you. If you didn't notice, you can still follow me socially at BBQ Central Show on Instagram, Twitter, TikTok, and Snappy Snaps slash BBQ Central Show on Facebook. Also, we are going live back again to YouTube against my better judgment. We are also going live video stream to something called twitch.tv slash BBQ Central Show. I try and keep it similar in setup and concept and ways to find things, even though we're on different platforms. We're off and running. I can see comments on every single video platform that we are going to. So I see everything coming in through Facebook. I see everything coming in through YouTube. I can cast those up on the screen if I am so inclined, but I don't want to get lost in the chat. But for those of you that were relentlessly banging on me for getting off of YouTube, I'm back on YouTube. And there's a whole thought to that. I'm not even going to get into it. First and foremost, as we get to some house cleaning, we want to wish a special happy birthday to third Tuesday of the month regular guest, founder of GrillGirl.com, Robin Lindars, who turns 68 today. Congratulations, Robin. Hope you have a great birthday. Email from Tim in Kansas. Fact check. Greg, before Sam the Cooking Guy came on last week, you said fourth Tuesday of the month. Was this show pre-recorded, and have we caught you in a slip-up? Hmm, good question, Tim. The fact of the matter is, if you listen to the whole segment, and yes, I did misspeak, or I misspoke, but again, if you listen all the way through the segment, you have also would have heard me refer to him as the first Tuesday of the month guest as well. So indeed... I corrected myself without even knowing that I had misspoke because, as you recall, he came on out of turn last month in helping me out. Good try to catch me up on a slip-up, Tim. But again, what's the benefit, me, of promoting a live show and going to do it live only to do it pre-recorded? That's bag move number one. What have we learned here? While I have tremendous bag qualities... Pulling bag moves is not something that I'm trying to do here on this show. I'm not trying to put one over on you or pull the wool over your eyes or hoodwink you, all these things. Julie Reinhardt is in the chat. Holy she smoke. Look out. What's up on the Pacific Northwest, Julie? How are you? Mike in Boston emails the show. Greg, your cat pissing rant was one of the best to date in the history of the show when you said Piscapades. I laughed out loud. That's right. I said Piscapades last week. If you missed that rant, it's the top of the second hour where usually you will find the most well-placed rants. And as I had mentioned a couple minutes before, there is a Piscapade update. While we have proliferated my new to house to me with feel away or flee away or whatever the hell you call the pheromone diffusers. There's like 10 in my house now that's supposed to make the cat calm and all this other stuff. While the cat hasn't pissed in the house in a week, we have also 
implemented a regimen of Prozac <laughs> for the cat. Much to the sh- cat's chagrin and dismay. Because as I had mentioned before, the cat has anxiety. On top of pissing in my house, he is now being overrun with cat pheromone to make him feel safe. And we are also trying to force down near two milliliters of Prozac. But I'm telling you, as much as he wanted to pee all over my house, that cat is relentless in not letting me stick that plunger full of Prozac medicine down his gullet. And you would figure, for as fat as that cat is, he would be happy to take anything. Prozac probably has some calories. It's only going to make him feel better. Hopefully it doesn't make him want to pee all over my house. But we're a week in for the better. But that's what's happening. The cat is now officially on Prozac. A cat's dose of Prozac. I wish I was making it up, but I'm not making it up. Oh, by the way, special shout out to my dad who cracked some ribs and suffered a mild concussion on a terrible walking accident last week. Uh So we hope you're feeling well, Pops. I had a whole bit planned for that, but I don't think that's going to fit in tonight. But you never know what happens. Guests could fall out and all of a sudden we're in the middle of something. Meathead will be joining me coming up here in a minute. I'll talk to you quickly about Green Mountain Grills before Meathead pops into the green room. Some of the best pellet cookers out there in the market today. And let me tell you, there's a choice line. There's a prime line. Choice line. So for the entry-level cook, for somebody that wants to save a couple hundred bucks, for somebody that doesn't want to have all of the technical wiles and technical capabilities, for instance, a Wi-Fi or two internal knee probes, or internal looking glasses into the main cooking chamber in the pellet hopper. You can save some money. Still get the same size Jim Bowie or Daniel Boone in the choice line, but you're saving a couple hundred bucks. Now, if you want to spend a couple hundred extra dollars, now you get the tech. You get the Wi-Fi, the two internal meat probes, the look-in windows where I just told you. You get a more solidly built chassis, And then they have Prime Plus now, which is just a few more bucks on top of the Prime line. That gets you things like uh, internal lamps and the meat cooking chamber, just to name a few. If you want to figure out which one is white white or right for you, go to the website, greenmountaingrills.com, and check out everything that they have to offer and then find a dealer near you because Green Mountain Grills pulls through dealers. Green Mountain Grills experiencing a great year as much of the live fire industry is, especially if you're in the business. Talked to Jason Baker a couple days ago and things are going very well. Product flying off the shelves. So find the dealer, go check one out, have them educate you, and then you're off and running when you get it to the house. No need to bring it back because buyer's remorse is taken care of right up front. GreenMountainGrills.com is the place to go. Meathead is coming up, hopefully, after this. Stick around. We'll be right back. Casting live from the Barbecue Central Show Studios in Cleveland, Ohio. You're listening to the Barbecue Central Show. Once again, here's your host, Greg Rempe. Hey, welcome back. This portion of the show being brought to you by Butcher's Barbecue, makers of award-winning injections, marinades, rubs, seasonings, barbecue sauces, grilling oils. All of Butcher Barbecue products tested on the competition circuit as well as backyards worldwide, backyards like mine, by the way. 
be the pit master of your neighborhood and visit butcherbbq.com to stock up now. I believe I saw Dave release a brand new episode in his podcast feed as well. So if you're not listening to the Butcher Barbecue Podcast, you're doing yourself a disservice. Really good podcast out there in the barbecue and grilling world. So do all that. Always trust your butcher. It is the second Tuesday of the month. You know what that means? We race for the hotline and welcome back friend of the show, Meathead from AmazingRibs.com. Hey, Meathead. Hey, 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 hello. How is the Hall of Fames? Hall of Fame? And what am I doing? Uh-oh. Are we the a Hall Bar- of Fame? The, the Hall of Fame city. The and Rock and the Roll. Satellite. The Rock and Roll Hall of Fame city. The Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. That's right. City. And but you are also the center of the Hall of Fame announcements and yes. all of that stuff. Right. Not a uh, not a act- active member yet. Uh-oh. We're working on that. As as you are too, we're but we're both really trying hard. I don't think either of us is getting in. I don't think so either. But it's great to try. Isn't it fun? <laughs> more fun to talk about. I mean, if we got in, then what would we talk about at least two months out of the year? You know what I want it for? I want it so that all these schmageggies on YouTube and Facebook. Who want to argue with me? I want to. I want to just be able to say, "Hey, when you're in the Hall of Fame, then I'll listen to you." That's right. You want to and drop that, the hammer on these people I with the Hall sh- of Fame. You know the the social media world. Oh, don't get me started. Oh, it, it, it is so full of silliness. Are you not a fan um, of social media? <laughs> no, I'm not at all. I I could live without it. You know, there's just an awful lot of Billy the Kids out there trying to shoot down Marshall Dillon. And, uh, you know, when we post something of interest that we know to be true, there are just people who want to argue. that. But, you know, that's the world of social media. Right. I've learned to live with it because it's a promotional vehicle. It's a broadcast medium to me. I use Twitter and Facebook to share but it's not a very good receiving medium. It's not a good two-way medium. Hmm. So if you could, you would just be happy to be done with it. It's a means to some type of oh, an end. That's it. I I would walk away in a minute. I mean, oh. um, yeah. But um, hey, I wanna I wanna you know you I'm on fire about my theme song. We're on fire. I just sent you a note and said, how come you don't play my theme song anymore? Yes. I wasn't on fire. But now I'm on fire. You are? You, you dissed it. It's a good... I need you next time I'm on... Hold on. ...to play my walk-on theme song and let the let the audience vote. I think it's a good song. You can't hurry ribs. You just got to wait. So hold, it's hold, a good hold song. On. Hold on, hold on. I got it right you here. Got you got it? Know, I mean, you know, of course I have. Well, let, let the world vote. Okay, wait a second. I got to make a few adjustments on my situation here. All right, for your okay. So, uh, and by the way, I do have uh, YouTube and Facebook comments up here. So, if you are so inclined to weigh in on if this is a if, if if this is a uh, if this is a walk up song, is that what you call it? A walk up song. There you go. Ask people yeah. right. like it or dislike. Like or dislike. Let's make sure we got the proper volume on it. Here we go for your listening pleasure and for your vote. It's a game of time and temp. You can hurry. You know the words better than I do. You just have to wait. Just trust wait for in the, the low Lord. and slow. No matter how long it takes. All right, now everybody vote on it. Look at this. I, you just gotta confess. Worst song ever. The reason you don't play it anymore is you keep forgetting because you're absent-minded. You know, all that gray hair, I got it too. Gray hair <laughs> is just gray matter that has leaked out. All your brains are on the sideburns of your head. How dare you? Did you, you said that I am absent-minded. I'm, meathead, my <laughs> recall of anything is is unquestionable. It, it could hardly. Uh, here's a here's a uh, here you go. Right right away, we'll go to some instant feedback. That song weak. What are you gonna weak? do? Weak. Weak. Okay, Who is that uh, weak? 
Here you go. Here's a friend of yours right here weighing in. Dino Dan. That's a no-no. Okay. No. Yeah. Here we go. A guy from a magical paradise called Hawaii, Lance Owen, saying no-go. Oh, boy. You're, you're, you're playing not. the negative response. No, no. Here we go. Here's a big Al weighing in from YouTube. Song is okay. C average. How about that? I'll take it. I'll Here's live average. fire cooking expert Julie Reinhardt from the Pacific Northwest. It's long, but in the spirit of not being a social media douche, good on you for making it. There's kind of a positive one from Julie. Just a, a quick scan. Julie's got a great uh, smile. I love her. Oh, yeah, Julie. Did you ever read that hey, book, uh, She Smoked? Something. What? Yeah. yeah. You she said something it. in the, in, in the, in the warm-up. Yep. Robin is 68? Yes, Robin is 68 years old. All right, now I got to tread lightly here. I got to tread real lightly here in the All Me right. Too era. Yes. But yeah, careful. Robin just does not look 68. Well, believe it or not, she I is put her 68 as they come. 45. No, Robin is 68 years old. Believe it. Take it to the bank. Unbelievable. It's amazing. Robin is. Uh, that Florida uh, sun, that Florida sun will treat shocking. you right, I guess, huh? Eating all that citrus down there. Right. Oranges, limes. What else do they have down there? Although you're more of a fan of, uh, like, Michigan fruit, aren't you? Oh, I'm a cold. Well, you know, I used to have a career in wine, and I have learned that fruit grown in cool climates is better balanced. You get a better sugar acid balance. Yeah. I mean, all the great wines in the world are grown in fairly cool climates. And the same is true for peaches. You have been following me on uh, social media, oh, obviously, because yes. oh, I've been raving about Michigan and Washington peaches this summer. Yeah, I've, um, the white peaches, the uh, freestone peaches, have just you know you eat them over the sink, mm -hmm. and they run down your chin, your arm. They're fantastic. It's been a great summer for uh, for pit fruits and uh, uh, particularly the cold climates. And I, I, you know, I love me Georgia and South Carolina barbecue, but Although Georgia is known as the peach state, South Carolina makes more peaches than Georgia does. And both of them I like, but they're just really rich and intense, and they just lack the acidity of the cool climate peaches. So um, for me, Michigan, Washington, Oregon peaches, they've been fantastic this summer. Uh, Meathead, before we get into a couple of the other topics, and we've touched on it before, but Friday is going to be the 19th anniversary of September 11th, 2001. Uh, as you look back, now almost 19 years ago, uh, thoughts on that day and, and where we are 19 days in advance, especially given the time that we're in this year? Unbelievable. I was, um, you know, like so many others, I, I work from home, so I'm here in my office and directly over my shoulder, you can see a dark doorway, but that's the dining room. There's a TV in the dining room. And, uh, you know, I heard something about it on the radio, and I went in and turned the dining room TV on just in time to see the second plane hit. And um, it was, um, it was you know, the same breathtaking, frightening moment for me as for everybody else. I had a little bit of irony involved. I was scheduled to fly from Chicago to Ithaca, New York mm. um, on the 12th. I was a frequent speaker at the Cornell University School of Hotel Management. I spoke on wine every semester and uh, uh, that trip obviously was canceled. Nothing flew over uh, for uh, weeks. But um, yeah, uh, I mean, it, 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 an event that it has totally changed the world uh, you know, it, well, it's up there. You know what we're going through now? COVID is something we're all going to look back on and wonder what life was like before COVID. Will we shake hands again? Will we hug again? Um, you know, I've traveled in the Orient and uh, so many people in Asia wear face masks yeah. prior to COVID. Will we be a society where many people just wear face masks as a matter of routine? Um, the thing about the face masks, and I'm, I wear them all the time, the th thing about face masks that is so frustrating is you can't see people smile. Um, uh, cashiers, uh, waitresses, people on the street. I, 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 boy, you know, how many times have we we've been taught to share a smile, to lift someone up with a smile? And that just is, is lost right now. 
it, 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 we, we've just been through too many tragedies. Indeed. Uh, Meathead from AmazingRibs.com joining me here on the show as he does the second Tuesday of every month. I appreciate you sharing that with me, Meathead. So let's move on a little bit. Um, I know what, you're... One other thing I wanted to touch base on that you t mentioned in your intro. Yeah, go ahead. And, and I'm a huge fan of Jess Pryles. Yes. Um, but this Just Keep Flipping stuff, yes. um, she's really made a... Um, uh, a mission of this, and it's a great mission because it really works. It's really important. But this has been around for a long well, time. Well, I don't I think mean, there's any dispute of that. So I don't think she would yeah, uh, I mean, she, say that she's she created. She didn't she certainly to discover this. Yeah. I mean, um, Harold McGee, Kenji Lopez Alt, and I and others have been talking about it for a long time. The whole concept is is we have to stop thinking about heat, and we need to think about energy. And there is energy um, pushed onto the surface of food, and it builds up in the surface, and it works its way towards the center. And if you flip, the energy bleeds off into the atmosphere, and so you get a much more even temperature in the center. If you don't flip, then you get this layering effect or the rainbow effect of a dark exterior, then a layer of brown, then a layer of tan, and finally it's medium rare in the center. And uh, the same holds true for chicken, turkey. Flip, 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 flip. The human rotisserie, um, it, 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 especially during the searing process, a uh, great technique. And I applaud uh, Jess for uh, pioneering or championing it. Yep, making it very popular these days, undoubtedly. One of the things that we have talked about in many versions of our visits over the years, Meathead, is barbecue on television. And it's something that we haven't seen yeah. really in any number of years, probably for any number of reasons. Perhaps uh, there was some watching fatigue. Perhaps it became a little too mundane for everybody. Or perhaps it just hit its crescendo and faded out and ran its life cycle like so many other things do here in our society, but on the 18th of November, a little upstart called Netflix is trying their hand at something called the American Barbecue Showdown. When I watched the trailer, and I don't want to take a dump on barbecue television because it's always a weird, well, it's always a weird dichotomy for me because... I'm just God not a... Forbid Greg is ever negative about anything, Mr. I know, Positivity. I don't want to be contrarian, but sometimes I'm forced. Uh, personally, and I'm obviously continually in the minority here because these types of shows are very popular. The chopped type shows, the contest type shows. It's just not appealing to me. That's the first part. Then there's the weird dichotomy. I usually know most of the contestants that are appearing mm -hmm. on these shows. So I want to have them on. I want to promote them. I want to hype them. I want to get good ratings, all this stuff. However I can help. And I want to see them all do well. But I'm always caught in this weird vacillating position. And my thought is, for instance, a longtime centralite, an incredibly accomplished competition cook, Sylvie Curry, is on the show on the 18th. In fact, she will be on in two weeks' time. And We'll talk we about all love Sylvie. Yes, absolutely. And she'll be a little less reined in. I was going to try and have her on tonight, but there was going to be a lot of hurdles for her to have to navigate, and I didn't want to do that. So in two weeks after it airs, that 22nd show, she'll be on, and uh, we'll be able to talk a little bit more freely. But as you watch the trailer, and I guess you're assuming what the show might be like, what are your, some of your first thoughts, and are you excited? Do you, A, have a Netflix subscription, and would you watch if you do? Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I really, first of all, I, I watch a lot of Netflix, uh, especially during COVID. Um, they've been doing some great stuff. And uh, they have two series now, this one, and there's another one, uh, Chef's Table, um, that focuses on barbecue. And uh, they, they both look to be a notch above average. The thing about these cooking contests, whether it's Netflix or anywhere else, is that I don't learn much from them. Now, when the first ones came out by John Marcus, whom I know is a friend of yours. Personal and friend. And mine as well, and appears on the show regularly. Um, John did the first uh, Pitmaster competition, and uh, it, it was really fascinating, and it was really uh, attracted a lot of attention. At the time, I was doing a weekly column in Huffington Post, and so I just started doing a weekly roundup of what happened on the show. 
But what frustrated me then and still does is that it's all about the personalities. It's all about the conflict. It's all about winning and losing. Um, it's all about, um, you know, they, 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 they all take the chef's pose, you know, arms crossed. They go, mm, I'm kicking ass today, you know. And, <laughs> <laughs> I've been invited to cook on a couple of these things, and I just can't do that. I just don't think, <laughs> first of all, I think if I went on one of these shows, I'd probably get my ass kicked, and that would ruin my reputation. <laughs> but what um, is Oh, God, yes. <laughs> Um, but, uh, you know, it, 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 all the posturing and posing and, uh, I mean, the, 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 the famous scene of, uh, Diva Q, um, uh, dissing her husband on national TV, um, or for her, now her former husband. Uh, I mean, I hope that if they do it right, we can learn something. Uh, we can learn a few tricks and techniques, learn something about the cuts of meat. I'm really glad to see they're cooking on Lang 48s. Now, for those who are listening and don't know what a Lang 48 is, this is a stick burner, a real log-burning barbecue pit. Um, and uh, um, in a lot of these previous contests, uh, there have been a variety of cookers, but they're all using the exactly the same pit, and they're using a pit that requires skill. Burning logs ain't easy. Burning logs requires fire management skills. And if you screw up, the flavor is bad. And so these people are going to have to really control fire, not just have a fancy injection or a sauce or a rub. It, there's a lot of complexity. Oh, there's a picture of the Lang 48. There it is. Yeah. Um, it's it's a nice machine. I had a Lang 36 for a long time, loved it. It's a reverse flow, um, and it, it it is a, um, a a tool that cooks exceedingly well if you know how to use it. You've got to work with it. Uh, you've got to control it. Uh, you, I mean, it, you know, you have wood and oxygen, and you have to have the right amount of wood, the right amount of oxygen. And if you get too much of one or the other, you got issues. So this that that's something alone. Uh, also, I'm 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 I I think that um, Melissa Cookston as a judge is a good choice. Um, she's a fine cook. I, I don't know the other judge very well. Kevin uh, Bloodsoe. Yeah, I, I I know of him, but I don't know him personally, and I don't know much about him. But. Um, I would I would think that having more than two judges would be good, but w whatever. Um, yeah, I'm looking forward to watching it. It should be fun. Are you watching the chef's table with Tootsie Tominance as well? Have you seen that? No, I haven't yet. I will watch it, though. I I've watched a lot of the chef's table shows um, because I do learn from them. There's an awful lot of interesting concept and technique, um, very, a lot of very chef-y stuff. And the idea that they've turned their microscope on barbecue will be interesting. So I'm looking forward to that. Um, it's just that my wife recently retired. So we're home together at night and we watch a lot of movies. We just watched Cinderella on Disney Plus the other night. Oh, look at you. <laughs> Catching up on the oldies and the goodies, I see. <laughs> well, no, oh, yeah. not the cartoon version. Oh. The actor version. The, 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 I don't know what they call it with real actors. Like the Broadway really version? Good. Uh, no, it was uh, you know it was uh, live. Uh, Lily, what's her name? Uh, it was just a good. It was uh, with real actors. It was yeah. good. All right, uh, Meathead is joining us here from AmazingRibs.com. Meathead, you stand by, and I will be right back with you, and we'll talk about seafood on the grill, and we will also talk about apples on the grill. Of course, as I was promoting that here over the last couple days, you can only imagine. Hearing apples on the grill and the other stuff that we've talked about on this show on the grill. So we'll get to that. I'll talk to you quickly about the Barbecue Guru. These folks created automatic pit temperature control devices. Are there other pit temperature control devices out there? A few. But why would you buy from somebody else when you can deal with the originators of the technology and ones who continue to revamp and then offer new product offerings? 
making it better and better each time. The barbecue guru has always believed that outdoor cooking can be easy and fun, especially when you're using their barbecue guru controllers or if you're using one of their two cookers that they offer right now. They have a ceramic cooker called the Monolith that has a built-in power draft fan already in the bottom of it. So in your luck, if you have a barbecue guru pit temperature control device already, you hook it to the power draft fan at the bottom of the monolith and you're off and running. Also, great new situation because you get all these accessories that some of the other Kamado companies are charging you an arm and a leg for or nickel and diming you for. Then you have the shotgun cooker, more of a cabinet style that also completely compatible with any of the barbecue guru pit temperature control devices. If you're not sure of what you need, please call them. 800-288-GURU that's 800-288-GURU or call I'm sorry or visit the website and see what they have to offer bbqguru.com that's bbqguru.com all right we are back with more meathead from amazingribs.com and we're talking about seafood and we're talking about fruit and if you have some Facebook or YouTube questions for Meathead. Throw them up. I'll cue them off and we'll answer them before the segment ends here this evening. So stick around. We'll be right back. Howard Stern, Jim Rohn, Dan Patrick, and Greg Rampey. The Mountain Rushmore of talk show entertainment. Now, let's get back to the Barbecue Central Show. This portion of the show being brought to you by CookinPellets.com, your number one source for quality wood pellets. For all of your pellet-driven cookers, visit CookinPellets.com for more information or to purchase. You can also buy them from Amazon.com as well if you would prefer. But it doesn't matter. It works in all of your pellet-driven pits. Don't worry about any of it. It's not breaking any warranties or it won't not work in this cooker or that cooker i have a number of pellet cookers they work on every one and they're great cb and the gang over there all right meathead thanks for hanging with me through the break there uh let's talk about seafood first i wanted to go apples but let's save apples uh for the end here Uh, let's talk about seafood because we've often heard on this show that if you weren't going to be meathead you were going to be fish head because of where you originally mm-hmm. started out there in the Florida yeah. coast, uh, going to University of Florida and so forth. So let's talk a little bit about seafood and the grill and perhaps one of the biggest scams going, and I kind of fell for it, and you sent me straight there a number of months ago, which is sea bass or uh, perhaps Chilean sea bass. There's a whole situation going around there mm-hmm. that as a consumer you need to watch out for. Yeah, well... Um yeah, you, you, you remember, and for those of your listeners who don't tune in every week or know me that well, um, I was raised on uh, both coasts of Florida. I also lived on the coast of Maine for a while on Long Island Sound. So I'm an East Coast uh, fisherman. I was born with a fishing rod in my hand. My dad always had a boat. We did a lot of fishing, and I do love seafood, and I would be fish head if I still lived on the East Coast. But I'm now in the Midwest, and uh, there is one truism about fish, and that is the fresher the better. Um, If you can pull it out of the ocean and club it over the head so it's dead, uh, scale it, gut it, and cook it, it don't get any better than that. If you've got to ship it to Chicago or Minneapolis, it's going to lose a couple of days, maybe more, and it deteriorates rapidly. Um, the other thing that's important, and this is key in, in shopping for fresh fish, is that if it's fresh, it needs to be kept laying in contact with ice. Um, if it's on a plastic uh, uh, pan or a sheet of plastic and ice is underneath, that's good. But when you lay fish right on ice, there's a very thin layer of water between the skin of the fish and the ice. And the warm fish melts the ice and creates this layer of water. And that water keeps the fish hydrated hmm. and keeps it moist. And that's really important. You need to keep it cold. You don't want necessarily want to freeze it. 
so you want to keep it cold and moist and if you put it on a plastic um, styrofoam sheet or something like they they like to do you're, you're preventing that now the, the the grocers the fishmongers like to do that because if they don't then they have to throw the ice out at night and they have to make new ice and ice is expensive it takes energy but it's the best way to handle fish so when you go shopping for fish and you see a fishmonger where the shrimp or the fish are laying on top of ice they're telling you we know how to handle seafood so that's the first thing always in any form of cooking whether it's low and slow barbecue brisket or whatever raw material start with the best you can get and that's the first thing now if you can't get fresh fish I would rather have fish that is blast frozen or fast frozen at sea or right at, at the docks because there when you freeze meats it forms ice crystals you may remember high school physics water expands when it freezes and ice crystals are sharp so whether it's uh, ribs or fish if you just pop it in your home freezer it's going to take time to freeze it's going to form ice crystals it's going to burst through the muscle fibers and you're going to get what they call purge or drip loss and when you open the bag or whatever you've contained it and there's liquid running around in there that's liquid that came out of the fish now it's not disastrous because there's a lot of liquid in there to begin with you've lost a little bit of it but it's still measurable um, the very best seafood purveyors um, catch the fish and either freeze it right at sea in a really low temperature freezer <laughs> which makes small crystals so there's very little purge or when it hits the docks they gut it scale it fillet it whatever they're going to do with it and then they wrap it blast freeze it um, this spring about four or five months ago um, when COVID first hit um, my wife and I subscribed to a service called Sitka Salmon Shares. Hmm. That's the name of it. Sitka, S-I-T-K-A, Salmon Shares. Sitka is a, a, a city in Alaska. Yes. And um, this is a essentially a co-op where they have a number of fishermen to go out. They're independent fishermen. They come back. They bring in their fish, and they blast freeze, and they ship around the country. And for a fee, I forget what it is, um, but you get – five pounds of fish a month and we've been just delighted with the quality very little um purge or when you open the the the, the shrink wrap now i and by the way i hope everybody out here knows i have never taken a nickel from anybody to endorse a product um this is not a paid uh endorsement it's a product i bought that i'm just delighted with being yep. a floridian yep. stuck in chicago getting this marvelous cod sable fish salmon five pounds a month shipped from this company uh really impressed um check into it if you're a member of our pitmaster club they offered a 25 dollars discount on the subscription to members of our pitmaster club nice but um uh, if you're going to if you can't get really really fresh fish then look for fish that has been blast frozen it's the next best thing now how do you cook it it's really good on the grill. We all know anything you cook indoors, you can cook outdoors, only better. And the flavor of flame and smoke really enhances fish. It adapts well to those flavors. Problem is, is that you're going to cook fish to 125 to 130 degrees. You don't want to go a lot higher. That is rare for a steak or, um, I mean, it, that, that's really fast cooking. So you're not going to get a lot of smoke flavor in there. And one of the techniques that we discovered, we invented actually, is we we went to our friend Brad Barrett, who makes grill grates. And uh, 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 Greg, if you can pull up a picture of what grill grates look like while oh, I'm everybody knows here. what grill grates look like. Well, okay, it's like the I most popular so. thing. Come on. Be yeah, it, it, it's a device that has valleys, and one of the things we told Brad about is we started throwing pellets or sawdust into the valleys and Greg is the one who named this technique close proximity smoking what happens is is the pellets start 
smoking, but they're only a half inch below the fish. So now you can put a layer of smoke on fish that's going to cook in 15 minutes, yet it still comes out golden, and you've got a really nice smoke flavor to it. It's a really good technique. You need to check it out. I write about it on AmazingRibs.com. I think Brad's been writing about it on his site. Uh, but it's a really great technique. And uh, the first fish I did it with was Chilean sea bass. Now, Greg mentioned Chilean sea bass earlier. There's a number of bass breeds out there. I mean, you've got large mouth bass and small mouth bass, which are lake fish, in freshwater fish. In, and then there's sea bass. But the Chilean sea bass actually was called Patagonia toothfish. And they just decided, that eh, that's a pretty hard name to market, Patagonia toothfish. So they named it Chilean sea bass. It's probably the most expensive fish on the market, and that's with good cause. It's going to be at least 35 40 bucks a pound. Wow. But it's a very beautiful, white, thick flake, tender and juicy fish, and it's just awesome. I know that's a lot of money to spend. It's like buying Wagyu beef. Do they but come in? Do they come in like pound portions, or will you go to a fishmonger and say, "I want X many pounds of Chittagonian toothfish"? <laughs> uh, well, Chilean sea bass is what most people call it now, and yeah, I think typically the portions are like eight, twelve ounces. They're, um, uh, you know, the size of my my fist or something. Yeah. They can be fairly thick, and you'd like that. Um, you know, anybody who's really into grilling knows thicker, the better thin foods cook way fast and tend to be overcooked in the center before the exterior browns or gets flavored. So you get, try for a thick piece. Um, and, uh, um, you probably have to go to a specialty fish market. I'm in a big city. If you're in a rural area, you might have trouble finding it. If you can't, Try to find a, I don't know where you buy it, uh, the uh, Sitka salmon chairs, I don't think they offer it because it's a it, it's a warmer water fish. But um, if you can get your hands on it, it really is worthwhile and it really adapts well to this rapid smoke flavoring or just grilling it. Now, when you just grill it, if you throw it on your grill, the, the, the age old problem, everybody has this with fish, is the protein in the fish just falls in love with the metal on your grate and it won't let go <laughs> and you it's it's just really hard another reason why i like grill grates is they have these spatulas that you can reach under and they lift the fish off the grate and again let me please stress i'm not paid to say this i just like this product um but it, it really is good for seafood um if you're going to cook fish one of the best techniques to keep it from sticking is mayonnaise. Now, I know there's just a lot of people, I run into this all the time, who just are grossed out by mayonnaise. They, it reminds them of pus or something. I don't know. But they're disgusted by the concept of mayonnaise. But it's mostly just oil. It's, it, I mean, mayonnaise is oil and egg yolks with a little lemon and salt. It's mostly oil. But it's a thick oil. Um, and you spread this on the fish. And it doesn't really make much of a flavor on the fish at all. You can't taste it. But it really helps keep the fish from sticking. So you coat the fish really heavily. Well, first, of, you want to season the fish. So you salt it, um, and then you put your rub on it. I like herbs, um, particularly tarragon, thyme, tarragon especially. Um, we've got a really nice seafood recipe, rub recipe called Marietta's Fish Rub on our website and sprinkle that on and then just a thick layer of mayonnaise and you lay it down and just wait till it lets go don't try to pry it up i mean that's true for all meats just let it, it will let go eventually and when it lets go you flip it over and um uh, you want to watch your internal temperature 130 135 at the most a lot of people like 125 um, you want to, you, you don't want to overcook. It depends on what your tastes are. I like it 125. My wife wants it a little more cooked. So you, I put, I put hers on first. Um, but, uh, um, uh, we just did a, um, uh, a zoom seminar for our pitmaster club and we had, 
um, uh, uh, Brad and Brooke from the shed in Mississippi, who they're fishermen, and a guy from Sitka Salmon Shares, another guy from the West Coast, all talking about seafood. And Brooke from the shed was talking about an interesting technique I'd never heard of, where they'll take fish and fillet it, but they'll leave the skin and the scales on, <laughs> and she'll cook it one side only, scale side down, um, and uh, lid down, so it will rose from above, smoke circulating inside, and um, the scales and the skin act like a buffer, and she calls it on the half shell. And when you pull it off, the meat comes up off the skin really easily. I've noticed that too. I've never left the scales on when I've done it. And that's a really interesting technique that she shared with us. So are you excited enough to try that on your own? You bet I will. Yeah, all right. Um, I've got, I've got um, a load of salmon from Sitka in my uh, um, freezer now, but uh, the next time I can, I'm going to try that. Absolutely. Yeah, the problem is, is I, I'm stuck here in the Midwest. I mean, I go fishing and if I catch a crappy, you know, I, I have caught five pound um, uh, largemouth bass in, in, in these fresh waters, but it, it's rare. And, uh, uh, you know, I just miss being on the coast. All right, Meathead, do you want to take a couple Facebook questions? Quickly before yeah. we run you off. All right. Uh, let's go yeah. to, looks like uh, Julie Reinhardt has something to say. It says, we happen to grill fresh halibut tonight on the Big Green Egg because this time of year it goes down to yeah. fifteen ninety five from 25 or 30 pounds. By we, yeah. I mean my husband cooked it while I drank wine uh, with his mom <laughs> on Zoom. It was perfect. All right. Yeah, well, All you're right. up in Seattle. That's I right. mean, uh, Seattle. Um, uh, Oregon, uh, and, and halibut is a cold, weather, a cold water fish. And, and like the fruits, I think, in general, your cold water fishes are uh, more interesting because they're fattier. Um, and particularly when you get down around the belly. The belly flaps are fatty because they protect the organs. Um, so, you know, uh, um, it's, for some people it may be too fatty, but um, salmon... Belly salmon is just really unctuous. All right, next remark coming in from Dino Dan Smoking. I cooked a ribeye in an air fryer, and I liked it. How do we feel about that, Vita? <laughs> you like that? <laughs> well, Good now for you, you. I know why you didn't like my damn son. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Good for you, Dino Dan. You're, uh, you're allowed to cook in whatever you want. No problem. No, uh, Big no, Al. No, all right, let, let's give him a break. First of all, air fryers have nothing to do with frying. I mean, the, the physics here is, is it's just a really good convection oven. Yes. I mean, you're, you've got hot air, and uh, it's blowing fast. And the beauty of blowing air across something is, is that when you put a cold piece of meat into an oven, there's a layer of cold air on the surface of the meat. Right. And it just sits there. And... If you put the fan on it, it'll blow the cold air away and the hot air in contact with it. So it cooks faster. Well, these air fryers just blow the air really fast, really hard. You've got high temperature. So you've got a high temperature, but it's it's like a broiler. And basically that's what a grill is, is it's an inverted broiler. You got the flame down below instead of from above as in a broiler. So you're getting some of that effect in it. I still think that, you know, if you're going to do a ribeye, and, you know, by the way, we've talked, you and I, Greg, about sous vide. I've given up on sous vide ribeyes and the best steaks because, you know what, they don't improve it that much. If you're going to do sous vide, use your tough cuts. Use your, use your rump cuts and your even brisket. Um, but uh, ribeye, I mean, for me, it's a grilling food. And by the way, oh, do you have that video? Have we got time to do the video? No, we don't have time now. Oh, my God. Let me tell everybody real quickly. Um, I grill um, flank steak over twigs of grapevines. And it takes 
10 minutes maybe at well over a thousand degrees I just posted a video on this um, youtube.com slash amazing ribs it's a five minute video um, you've got to go see very impressive how I cook this flank steak it's absolutely fantastic and if you can get um, twigs of fruit wood hardwood or nut wood um, you want to try this technique uh, it's a technique I learned in France and it really is awesome. All right, answer this last question, Meathead, from Big Al. Any thoughts on cooking ribs hot and fast with a vortex in a Weber kettle? Cut the ribs, uh, rub, and put on a grill like wings. Seen a couple people say they've liked it and they have tried it. Your thoughts on that? Well, one a, a basic rule of meat science is high temperatures sque uh, shrink the muscle fibers. When muscle fibers shrink, they squeeze out juices and you get drier food. Um, now I've had, I mean, you know, when I first started getting in a barbecue, everybody used to say Dreamland in Tuscaloosa, Alabama was the worst barbecue joint in America because they grill <laughs> them hot and fast over direct heat. And um, I just kept got tired of hearing all this dissing. And even though I'm a gator and I hate the Crimson Tide with a passion, of course. I went to Tuscaloosa went to dreamland and fell in love with the ribs even though they're grilled hot and fast because they t had a flavor like a steak they were grit the meat on the exterior got that maillard effect flavor and the fat um uh, seared um so you know you, you'll get some really interesting flavor um you'll drive off moisture but with ribs and other fatty cuts the real juiciness often comes from the fat, not from the water. Fat. So, you <laughs> so you might want to try it. I'm still a fan of low and slow ribs. Um, I've often said I don't bother with the Texas crutch because it's too much trouble, and I love uh, a good bark. But I've been crutching lately, and my wife is in love with those ribs, so yeah. I'm I'm backing off on my uh, uh, Texas crutch. Rob Bass uh, says oh, that he believes well, Dreamland is great too, and I love, I love Dreamland, and that was the point. The three of us um, also hate Alabama. Yeah, I mean, you know, for years Dreamland was just dragged through the mud because all the barbecue snobs. And by the way, there's an awful lot of barbecue snobs out there. You're talking me. They just are not cooking indirectly, uh, and therefore it's not real barbecue, and that was just uh, not the case. That's right. Uh, you can find Meathead right here on the second Tuesday of every month. In the meantime, please hit him up on social media. He's waiting there with bated breath to take you I on. Do. By the way, turn. I hate social media, but I personally do all the tweeting and the That's response. Right. To, I get a little testy sometimes. Um, somebody, I just posted a recipe for Syracuse salt potatoes, and somebody asked me, is there a low-sodium version? Oh, dear. The recipe is called Salt Potatoes, you idiot. That's right. <laughs> salt Potatoes. Yeah. Find them on AmazingRibs.com or at social medias, but more importantly, the second Tuesday of the month right here. Meathead, always appreciate the time, pal. Always fun to talk to you, Greg. And let me say hello to my buddy Doug and your remote correspondent who has recently been concussed. Oh, that's right. Yes. Well, Yes, yes. Thank you. Doug, 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 you. You can talk about Doug, but Doug, uh, Doug's okay. I just talked to him today. All right. Well, uh, I'm sure he appreciates the well wishes, and we'll talk to you again next month. There's Meathead, everybody. Right there. Get out of here. Meathead is right there from AmazingRibs.com, and we'll just turn this into a quick transit. All right. We'll turn this into a quick transition. How quick? This quick. Stand by as we close the first hour. Continuing to produce incredibly mediocre content in an exceptionally professional way. You're listening and watching the Barbecue Central Show. Once again, here's your host, Craig Rampey. Hey, hey. I don't have enough time to roll through it here, but that's all right. Lance Owen. 
Owens. I've given up on sous vide. Thanks to Meathead and Greg, I have another gadget stored above the icebox. What's that? What do you have stored above the icebox, Lance? Okay, we're back right after this. Stick around. This is Doug Chiding, the Road Cookers. Happy to have you aboard here for the really big barbecue show. Boing. We cook because we have to, and we grill because we want to. Hit me. Fine. How you doing? <laughs> you have a great show. I'm a big fan. Boing. So what, what, what seems to be the problem here? This man looks like he's dead, and he's in the, in the crackle. Charbono. It's all about the Charbono, dude. Succulent fish. What? We ate two feet before we nursed. How much liberty is shit feast? I'm shaking like a dog shit peach seed. <laughs> we have top men working on it right now. Hey, just like that, we're into the second hour, and you have found the Barbecue Central Show. Time flying by at breakneck speed. 2020 rapidly coming to a close. You didn't think I was going to fit that in there today, did you? I did. Just did it. It's the Live Fire Fun and Frivolity Show coming to you live from Cleveland, Ohio. This time aboard. Around. This time around, we're brought to you by Fireboard. And Fireboard 2 and Fireboard 2 Drive, where you can monitor six different temperatures simultaneously, connecting to something called Wi-Fi for cloud-based monitoring, or another item called Bluetooth. If you have Alexa or a Google Assistant in your home, you're in luck because Fireboard 2 and Fireboard 2 Drive fully integrated with both. Find out more by visiting fireboard.com or call 816-945-2232. I also talked with Ted Conrad at the end of last week, and believe it or not, they have new products coming out before year end. So we will be having conversation with Ted before 2020 actually does come to a close. Dennis Busso, embedded correspondent from Colorado, saying, if you can believe this, I'm going to put it up here for everybody to see snowing here tonight keep it over there dennis nobody wants snow by the way we hope your uh, wife is feeling well good thoughts continuing to be passed from the rock and roll hall of fame city out there to you in colorado good to see everybody on facebook and uh, youtube once again if you are not familiar or you miss the open of the show we are streaming live video to such platforms as the Facebook show page for the Barbecue Central Show, which is slash BBQ Central Show. Also back on YouTube, which is youtube.com slash RD Rempe, because I'm not allowed to have my own custom name yet, because YouTube is a piece of trash and I hate it, but I'm still going there because I'm a hypocrite. Also, we're trying something new out, twitch.tv slash BBQ Central Show. The comments are turned on for Twitch, however... Through the list of comments that I'm seeing here over Meathead segment, I see nothing that indicates that anybody's watching over on Twitch. But it all archives in its own independent situations, and there you go. So if you wanna if you've always thought it was great that I was on YouTube or that's the only way you consume your live video streams, then fine, I'm back there right now. They will also start archiving, and I'll continue to get my uh, 100 total views. <laughs> oh, it's a whole thing, believe me. Still to come on the show, Jess Pryles in about 11 minutes, and then we will also have Brian Schaff from Certified Angus Beef. You can follow me socially on Instagram, Twitter, TikTok, and Snapchat at BBQ Central Show. And again, uh, live video feeds on Facebook, YouTube, and Twitch. Coming up on the best moments of the Barbecue Central show in 10 minutes or less this Friday, we will find episode 141, taking you back to September 10th, 2013. So seven years removed roughly to the day 
Uh, as I had mentioned with Meathead, Friday is the 19th anniversary of the terror attacks on this country, specifically, of course, New York City, Washington, D.C., and the thwarted attack, which saw Flight 93 go down in Somerset County in Shanksville, Pennsylvania. Many think that it was heading to the White House or perhaps the Capitol building. So as I ask every year at this time, make sure you remember what happened this coming Friday and how it changed us and how it changed us as humans, how it changed us as a people in this country. Make sure you remember all the folks that perished that day and how you felt as we were under attack. It's especially different given this year and the coronavirus, the battle we're fighting on many fronts as far as that's concerned, but obviously in a much more different way. I don't know in my lifetime if I will ever have those feelings as I did as I was venturing out into rural Sandusky, Ohio, listening to the Howard Stern Show in the morning and hearing a reported plane crash into one of the towers. And they were just re like a propeller plane. And then hearing, you know, eight, ten minutes later that, because then it was up on everybody's TV in the studio watching the jet airplane fly in to the second tower and then realizing that we were under attack. Uh, that was a, a feeling that I'll never forget. So I want to make sure that we never forget September 11th, 2001. Of course, my ongoing fear here is that the further away we get from that day, the more chance it will of being forgotten. And there's now a lot of people that weren't alive for that particular event in our history. So it doesn't have the same impact to them. And of course, my deepest sympathies are going out to all the folks who were affected directly. And remember, you know, as you rewatch history this coming Friday on the number of specials that will most likely be played through that day and the night, it was only a few years ago that I realized that there are people out there today who watch the planes hit the towers and the Pentagon and hear the radio traffic of Flight 93 going down into the field in Somerset County, Pennsylvania, in Shanksville. And they have to watch and or hear their loved ones who were on those planes going into the fields or into the Pentagon or into those towers and die all over again every single year. And I can't imagine, and I didn't understand that for years. For years, I didn't understand it, and I would do a long standing segment on the show and recount exactly where I was and exactly how I was feeling and where I went and we would get call-ins and we would do all these things. And as I was watching a 9-11 show a couple of years ago, they were talking with, it was a mom or a dad of somebody who was on one of the flights that went into the World Trade Center towers. And she said, you know, what most people don't realize is that I will not watch television on September 11th. And I was a champion of show everybody these videos, have a channel on cable television that constantly reruns 24-7 everything that happened that day because I was very fervent in my belief that we never wanted to not be able to see it because we would then forget it. And I didn't want that to happen. But when I hear the lady say, I don't watch television on September 11th because... I have to watch my son or I have to watch my daughter physically watch my son or daughter die all over again. I can see when they're alive and all of a sudden I can see when they are not with us anymore. So I don't watch television on September 11th. I don't want to see that over and over again. And I never understood that. That never was on my radar until I heard that lady say that. And so 
Now, I won't go over the top, but I will also refuse to not mention it as I close the show out every week. I will refuse to not bring it up in some form or fashion as we are within that September 11th week. I believe there has been one time when, or, or a few times when September 11th has actually happened on a Tuesday slash show night or just the day after or perhaps the day before. But whenever we are within that week, I will always talk about it. I will always bring it up because I never want anybody to forget what it felt like, where you were, how we felt as a country. I mean, think about where we are as a country now and how divided and how unjust and how in transition we are amongst ourselves right now. But you can't deny it. No matter what side you're falling out on, this isn't like any other time we have seen. And then think back to the days post-attack. Everybody was on board. Everybody had each other's back. Everybody was willing to throw in and help and make it better at any cost. And I don't want that to be a driving factor to help today, but I mean, we could certainly look back and take a few notes to help ourselves here, right? So once again, September 11th, 2001, I will continue to never forget. And that show will be coming up on The Best Moments this Friday. That will be from September 10th, 2013. And you have to be subscribed to the podcast in order to get that. Jess Pryles is coming up out of the break. We'll get her thoughts on 9-11 as we approach this Friday as well as talking a bunch of live fire cooking stuff. Head on over to Big Papa Smokers right now, the one-stop online shop for all things Barbecue and grilling related, a curated selection of only the best outdoor cooking and grilling supplies. We'll get you on the path to better barbecue results in no time. Everything at Big Papa Smokers has been Pitmaster approved by Sterling Big Papa Ball himself. They have 13 perfectly balanced flavors of rubs and seasonings that transform ordinary meals into extraordinary. Whether you're cooking to impress the judges or grilling for family and friends, Big Papa's has something for every type of of competition and a backyard cook. They also own Granny's Barbecue Sauce. So if you're looking for a great new go-to sauce, that is great right out of the bottle with no doctoring needed. You have it in that. If you like a good base rub, try Granny's as a base and then doctor from there. Either way, it's fine or something in between that. They also sell grills and cookers over at BigPapaSmokers.com, of course. If you're looking for a versatile smoker that's easy to use, Check out the Mac 2 Star General Pellet Grill. Big Papa Smokers, the exclusive Mac dealer. They're even offering special packages. They have a brand new revamped Mac 2 Star General Pellet Cooker as well. If you're not a fan of pellet smokers, fine. Try the Old Hickory Ace BP, the only charcoal smoker that Big Papa trusts on his competition trailer. If you're not sure of what grill you need, give them a call. They'll walk you through all the steps. 877-828-0727 or shop their website at bigpapasmokers.com. Big Papa Smokers, B-I-G-P-O-P-P-A, smokers.com. Your one-stop online shop for all things barbecue. Jess Priles is in the green room. We'll get to her in just a second. Stick around. You are listening and watching the Barbecue Central Show right here on the Barbecue Central Network. Monthly visits from a killer hog, a cooking guy, a man named Meathead, the author of Barbecue Bible, a grill girl, a bristly barbecue journalist, and the male feasance of the barbecue world known as the Embedded Correspondence. Only found right here on the Barbecue Central Show. And this portion brought to you by Pit Barrel Cooker, the most unbelievable outdoor cooking device on the planet, currently available in two sizes, the regular and the junior. Pit Barrel Extra Big, coming maybe fourth quarter, maybe turn of the year. We'll see how that goes. Whether you're a beginner or professional, definitely a cooker you want to add to the arsenal. Visit pitbarrelcooker.com. 
and tell them the Barbecue Central Show sent you. In fact, I got my Pit Barrel Jr. in the mail. Just the cutest little cooker. Mega cute. By the way, if I can put it together in 10 minutes, that tells you exactly how easy it is to put together. So don't be scared about any of that regular size or junior. Hey, my first guest in the second hour, a successful business person, an author, brand ambassador, appears on TV from time to time, founder of the highly successful Hardcore Carnivore brand. And we can also add college students to the list now. And we'll talk about that here in just a second. So let's hit the hotline and welcome back Jess Priles to the show. Hey, Jess. Uh, I have no audio. Are you there? Hold on. Are you there? Hold on. Check, check, check. Oh, dear. Let's just relax for one second. Can you just re disconnect and then reconnect back in? And we should be all set. Gonna learn from that uh, Derek Riches fella because he was like, you know, all that. So uh, disconnect and then come back in. We should be all set. We'll uh, we'll wait for you. No problem. So uh, we'll wait for Jess to rejoin here in just a second. And in the meantime, uh, I will thank Meathead from AmazingRibs.com for joining me. Now. All right. How hey, are, we, how are we doing now? Hundred percent better. Thank you very much. See, look, I learned things too. And two weeks ago, I had Derek Riches on the show, and we did all this testing as we did earlier today, and all this other stuff. Right? And there was no sound. And I said, <laughs> you know, now eight or nine minutes later, I said, why don't you disconnect and come back? Everything was fixed, so we just level-headed it. Said, hey, go out, come back in, and away we go. So yeah, have, uh, you tried, have you tried resetting your computer, sir? Oh, uh, of, of course you would believe the amount of hurdles I go through before I actually start streaming. <laughs> and number one is always a hard reset to make sure that there aren't any internet bugs or programs that would be tripping me up, things of this nature. So, oh yeah, it's a whole mm -hmm. situation. So uh, before we get into talking about your meet science graduate certificate program and the just keep flipping method if we could because maybe you'll have a unique view on this uh friday is september 11th the 19th anniversary of the attacks here in this country uh, many folks have that day burned in their memory for obvious reasons but i was wondering how when you hear that date uh, how does that strike you and perhaps what were you know some of your initial thoughts as you started seeing that go down uh, so I was in Sydney at the, at, on that date visiting, and because of the time difference, I remember very specifically, um, I was staying at a friend's apartment, and I went to bed kind of early-ish, like 11 o'clock, and I woke up the next morning, and by the time I'd woken up, everything had happened, mm -hmm. and my friend said to me, we didn't want to wake you because we weren't sure if the world was gonna be here. Like we thought you should oh, deserve wow. one more sleep. So it was really different kind of just waking up to all of it. But I think the show of solidarity in the days afterwards in such a hardened city like New York to come together like that and, and the humanity and just the the way that everybody was just so nice to one another mm. you know I feel like we could use a lot more of that now more than ever no doubt about it uh just priles joining me here on the show uh, just priles.com and hardcore carnivore.com at just priles on social media also at hardcore carnivore depending on how you're going to tag or follow or do all of those things i had mentioned it a couple mm. seconds ago jess but Going back to school, meet science graduate certificate program at Ohio State. <laughs> what? Iowa State. Oh my State. God! What an idiot! Iowa I apologize. State. Iowa State. You know, it just You're rolls the off the tongue. You know what? Uh, let me back out just for a second. I can't even believe that I would make that mistake because I did not even go to Ohio State. I went to Ohio University, so I don't even know where the hell Ohio State came from. God, can we just quit and restart all over again? I can't believe I did that. Yes. I apologize. Iowa State okay. University, a cyclone, ISU. which is great. Cyclone. Cyclones, mm -hmm. we love that. Do you know who the most prolific cyclone is to come out? 
I don't because I'm dealing with my own issue, which is that before that I was a Longhorn fan and now we <laughs> play each other. So what do I do? Uh, yeah, I think it's Darren Worth from Who Iowa Smokey D's, right? Darren Worth. Really? Yeah, he's a there clone. Yeah, no doubt. Prolific. Uh, yeah. So uh, let's talk about the program itself and why you're going back to college. I'm going back to college. It's, it's the first time I've been to college in the States. I have a degree from Australia. Um, and basically it's a meat science graduate certificate. So it, it, like I had to apply to college. I had to make my case. I had to get the, the, uh, the faculty to approve me. And it was like, it wasn't just like a, yeah, like I put my hat in the ring and they pulled it out. Like it was, it was quite an, an endurance sport. Um, but anyway, it's a, it's a, a meat science grad certificate. So over the years that I've been kind of honing my craft and learning about this stuff, one of the things that's been most fascinating to me is learning about the how and why. And that's, you know, every time I've been on here, I've really enjoyed talking about, you know, the idea and the science and the dry aging and all that kind of stuff behind things. And I've picked up a lot over the years, but I always felt like, oh, man, I wish I could answer that question without, you know, without having to refer to friends of mine who are meat scientists. And it's, uh, it took me, you know, it took me several decades of my life to want to go to school, but I just woke up one morning and I'm like, oh God, I get it now. Like I get what it's like to want to study. So uh, I've already started, I'm, I'm in my processed meats course and like I've already learned so much um, that I can apply and, you know, share with people to make their meat cookery better ultimately. Um, and, and in some ways it also helps validate, you know, like we got to the section on, on what gives meat its color. And I, you know, I knew, I knew a lot of what was being presented. So having the certificate will help kind of validate that too, which I'm really excited about. When you look back at a younger Jess Pryles going to college or university or, you know, whatever they call it in, in Australia, um, and, yeah. you know, what I think is funny, as you look at it here in the States, there seems to be these regimented steps that a youth feels like they must take. And they feel like that because the adults are pressing those mandates down, which is go through high school. And then without question, you should then go to college. But you're talking about somebody who is 18 years old, maybe not even 18, and doing a four year stint on what the hell do you want to do for the rest of your life when really those four years might be better served trying to figure out who the hell you are and how that might feed into a passion that might lead into what you want to do for the rest of your life. So while I did do those steps, um, I certainly don't feel like I would tell my kids, hey, you have to go to college after high school. Uh, if you want to find yourself or you feel passionate about something or you want to do a trade or something other than that, uh, I'm a champion for it. So long way to go to, to get and say, when you look at a younger Jess Pryles going to college, how do you view it now as someone who is more worldly and has gained a tremendous amount of experience versus someone who was a lot greener back then? I get it. I mean, I, you know, I definitely felt that pressure you were talking about. Both my parents went to college and there was just this expectation that I would too. And I certainly had no idea what I wanted to do at the time and really never thought that I would end up doing this. Um, in fact, most people aren't even aware that meat science is a degree. I certainly wasn't until several years ago when I started realizing that so many universities across the United States and the world do offer it. And what meat science is, is basically like, why the quality of beef in the grocery store is so good, why processed meats have come so far over over the years. So not just food safety, but you know, it, it's it's a really, really interesting field. Um I I don't know, I, I kind of feel like parents are sort of worried that if the kid doesn't go to college, they're gonna end up being like a bum in a corner somewhere. So it's like, here, take this path. Enjoy. But I definitely think that the later in life uh, perspective is helpful. How are you juggling the duties of CEO, content creator, brand ambassador, wife, and everything else you have going on, and then still trying to find the time to dedicate to the school demands? I mean, if you weren't already a time magician, this just has to add <laughs> a unique layer on top of all that other stuff. 
It does. It does. And that's why it's the certificate, not the degree so that it's manageable. <laughs> I still have to do, I'm cramming in about four to six hours of school per week, which doesn't sound like much, but think, I mean, it's, it's intensive, like concentration hours, right? So I've got a planner, I've got a million sticky notes that you can't see on my screen and you just, you just make it happen. If you want it bad enough, you just make it happen. Just do it. Go out Get, there. Getting Get this certificate aside from all the other things that uh, come along with it, is this something that you could then say, I have this in the portfolio and now I'm going to 180 and do a completely different career path? Or is it just a accumulated knowledge where, you know, as you said, kind of in the beginning, now you can speak even more from a position of authority? So because it's a certificate, it doesn't, it, I mean, it doesn't technically qualify you to go and get a job at a, at a major meat company as if you were a spe meat science specialist or a or graduate degree or what have you. It's more that it, it was really more for me to understand the hows and whys. Like now I understand about molecular binding of water and, and not just like why we rest our steaks, but the intensive science behind why you rest them. And that, that makes a tremendous difference. Um, so there's a lot of different stuff like that. So it, it it gives me the information to fill in a lot of gaps to to make to make it make sense. Not just okay, well I know this works, but why does it work? But I think there's also something there in terms of like, well, how are you going to argue with someone who's got like formal certification <laughs> degrees? Right. right. That's right. That's why we have the experts and uh, those that have went to school to accumulate the knowledge. Uh, you know. I mean, it seems like anybody anymore will question anything no matter what, but, uh, you know, at least you do or, and can say, hey, I, oh, by the way, I, I have this. I went to school and I did this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's that, the end. That transitions nicely into cooking steaks. And there have been many evolutions, or perhaps some say evolutions, of how to cook steak during the 12 years of the show. Initially, it was high heat. Flip once, rest, it's all done, now you can eat it. There was a small movement of lower heat direct grilling, so you get the grill to 350 degrees, flip it once, then take it to an internal temperature of preference. Then, of course, reverse searing and sous vide, which has really been one of the more prominent ways to cook at least thicker steaks and other bigger cuts over the past three, four, maybe five years. But here comes a method that I heard about from Adam Perry Lang years and years ago on the show once and really never heard about it too much again. And then there's this lady in Austin who calls it just keep flipping method. And oh, by the way, that's you. So at what point do you decide that this is a method that you were going to more and more so much so that you're going to start making social media posts and you're going to be doing more research and more cooking. When does it really take hold of you and, and become a passion project? So I have that Adam Perry Lang book and he's, he's a legend too. And when I started posting about it, I just call it JKF now for ease of use. And when I started posting about it, a lot of people were like, Oh, Heston Blumenthal does that too. <laughs> so I've never claimed to have invented right. it. In fact, I feel like it's probably the oldest, like, I feel like it may be as old as cooking over fire itself. But in this day and age, everyone is very much into methods, techniques, you know, the reverse sear. It's, you know, well, but did we have a name for the opposite of the reverse sear at any stage? I'm not sure. So what happened was I started to do a lot more video work um, and publish a video every week to my social media and my website and my YouTube, gratuitous. And I realized it basically made me focus on what I was doing because I had been doing this all along and not realizing it. So mm. I filmed this video for how to cook a tomahawk steak. And I did what I always do, which is light a whole chimney of charcoal, dump it into one area. So not spread it out. Like I hate, I, it's like the worst that 350 degree heat you're talking about is the worst. Um, put all the coals together, <laughs> flip, 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 flip got like this mega crust on it, put it on the indirect side to kind of where I wanted to, quick butter brush, quick flip because the coals were still live, done. And I'm like, oh my God, what was that? Because that wasn't a reverse sear and that was like a three-part 
because I'm filming it and I have to talk about it. So I actually have to like be conscious of it. Yep. So I'm like, I, I don't know. I guess this is just the way I do it and it works. And then it just made me start thinking like, you know, I really, this is the way that I cook. Like I ended up writing this article about it because I feel like reverse sear has taken over. I feel like reverse sear is amazing for people who are starting out. Like if you're nervous about cooking steak and you're not a great cook and you want to give it a shot, it's a great fail safe mm -hmm. to start off with. But I've equated it to like riding with the training wheels on or bowling with the bumpers in, you know, like if you don't ever get over that hump, you're never really learning to grill properly. And I feel like with reverse sear, a lot of people are so obsessed with that edge to edge color yep. that sometimes they won't get the crust. Like it'll be colored, but you won't get that nice Maillard, like rendered beefy crust sensation. And then that's not what it's supposed to be about either. Like that, that happens a lot with sous vide, you know, um, because it's been cooked and they don't want to overcook it on the edges too much. Um, but I also think that, just that art of you know sort of wasteful as well i know i know a lot of people who reverse sear by starting in an oven and will fire up their whole grill especially the ceramics because they get so hot for literally two minutes of searing which is crazy <laughs> right. so i guess i'm just encouraging people that if you're ready to move on to something a little bit more advanced and you want to understand the fire a little bit more jkf works so the principle is that you keep cooking over extremely high heat you keep flipping every 20 to 30 seconds why it's not as exact as reverse sear because reverse sear i say put it in at 250 or 275 cook it until it's 130 internal sear it for one minute on each side over a searingly <laughs> hot you know surface done with jkf it is 20 or 30 seconds and if you're getting a flare up it's more frequently so you do need to be a little bit more intuitive with learning about the meat but that's how you learn that's how you experience that's how you learn the difference between cuts it's a much more connected i guess method of cooking because you're understanding the charcoal you're understanding the heat it's giving off you're actually watching that maillard reaction happen and you're getting that perfect crust too so i've just been really pushing it because the biggest reward for me, honestly, has been I, the other reason that reverse sear is a little bit like, come on, y'all, like, really? And I was a huge reverse sear fan for a long time. Sure. Everyone who's been trying JKF again are either new-ish people or seasoned grillers that just got so caught up in it they forgot. And they're posting and they're like, dinner was 15 minutes and just as good, if not better, instead of two hours <laughs> to cook a steak. And that's what, all it needs to be. I mean, th there's a time and place for reverse sear. Someone else said, like, it's about having the methods and then knowing which one to use. It's not that one is significantly better than the other. It's just that one is not king, you know? Got to know all of them. Got to know all the tricks. All right, so the end question to just keep flipping is, is there a point where you are using too thick or too big a piece of beef where just keep flipping isn't going to work or regardless if you keep doing your end of it as the grill person the results are going to yield roughly the same so the point of jkf uh, as well is that it does work on any size piece of beef particularly mm -hmm. thin ones which reverse here doesn't work on so here's the theory the theory is if it's a huge piece of beef it will still work if you stand there and you just keep flipping it it will be perfectly cooked on the inside with a crust on the outside but obviously let's say for like a three inch t-bone that's going to be quite arduous so in those cases what i do is basically the reverse reverse here <laughs> which is where I just keep flipping until I get the crust that I want. Then I move indirect until it finishes cooking how I want it to. And I'm, I'm going to be posting about that soon. That's what I call sort of the next level because you want the introduction. Just understand the concept that it does work. And once you understand the basic concept, then we can move on to round two. All right. Uh, we're talking with Jess Priles from JessPriles.com and HardcoreCarnivore.com. Follow her on social media and all those places as well. Before I let you go last time, I asked you what the best Alice in Chains song was. And while you were very close, we both agree that you were wrong. So before I <laughs> yeah. let you go this evening, what is the best Ariana Grande song? 
the answer is I don't know any Ariana Grande songs. That's a is lie. That correct? That's a total lie. I swear. No, really? What I is? I swear it? I don't. Re okay. Well, I swear I don't. Here you go. The answer, of course, is no tears left to cry. House full of women. What can I tell? You? Go listen to it. I don't know, love. dude. I just posted Metallica tonight. I don't, you know, <laughs> like sorry. <laughs> We can Look agree. Look at my latest reel, Greg. It's Master of Puppets. Like we, I don't oh. know Ariana Grande from whatever. We we can agree that whatever took place uh, after and Justice for All and previous to Hardwired was total complete crap. Correct? Yeah, I mean, yes. For me, it's Ride the Lightning. Yes. yes. Yeah. yeah for me, it. it's Ride the Lightning. All right. Uh, follow Jess over at JessPriles.com, HardcoreCarnivore.com. Get all the rubs and uh, make sure that you are keeping up with her. And subscribe to the YouTube channel because, as she had just mentioned, she is posting videos once a week to the various platforms. Do uh, you want to tease what's coming up? Yeah, the JKF Part 2 is coming up. I'm all working right. on a little something with all the dub I shot this weekend, which is pretty exciting. Sorry, dub. Yeah. Nice. Sorry, Bird of Peace. Yeah. Looks like your SOL. Yeah, so. you bought the peacemaker to the doves. Hey, that's yeah. why they pay you the big bucks, Greg. That's right, no doubt. <laughs> All right, uh, get over and check Jess out. And, just, just come and, look. There's a lot of stuff. All right, yeah. and get over there to the YouTube, watch it all. In the meantime, thanks, Jess, so much for coming on, and we'll talk to you again soon. Thank you. Talk soon. All right, there she is, Jess Priles from HardcoreCarnivore.com and JessPriles.com. And we will be back in just a few short seconds with Brian Shaw from Certified Angus Beef. I will talk to you quickly about Pits and Spits. You know, since 1983, way back when I was nine, Pits and Spits handcrafted smokers and grills in Houston, Texas, and since that time, establishing itself as one of the premier brands and high-quality offset smokers, more recently, pellet cookers, Pits and Spits sets itself apart by using heavy 7- and 10-gauge steel in every cooker, fully welded construction that you can feel when you use the unit, 304 stainless roll-top lid, and a front shelf on every single smoker. Why does it matter? Well, by using higher-quality materials, Pits and Spits smokers reach and maintain temperatures, allowing you to worry more about the meat than the heat. And by providing a fully welded smoker, you don't have to worry about grease and smoke leaking out of the barrel or about the grill rattling apart as you move it through the backyard. By using 304 Stainless, you're getting an heirloom quality product that you will be able to pass down to your kids. Now, where some companies focus on being the low-cost provider, Pits and Spits focuses on craftsmanship and using quality materials. Are there cheaper ways to manufacture products? Sure. They don't like tack welds, cheap stainless and electronics you can't count on. Having in-house manufacturing gives them complete control of the design and standards. That's not something you're going to find in products brought in from overseas. Their steel suppliers are using materials that can be used in some of the harshest environments. So they'll perform in any and all conditions. And their controllers are made right here in this country. So you have unimpeded transparency to the programming. Pits and Spits has a dealer network across the country. But if there isn't one close to you, feel free to give them a call at 844-650-6250. That's 844-650-6250. Whether you're a backyard grill master looking to cook steaks for the family or a competition team smoking 50 racks of ribs, Pits and Spits has a product for you. You can check them out online, pitsandspits.com. All one word spelled out, Pits and Spits. Or see their pits in the wild across social media at their handles, at Pits and Spits. Brian Schaff coming up. We thank Jess Pryles again for last segment. Stick around. We'll be right back. Celebrating over 10 years of prolific and unparalleled live fire barbecue and grilling talk. And yes, it's still being done from Cleveland, Ohio. You're listening to the Barbecue Central Show. This portion of the show being brought to you by Smithfield throughout this grilling season. You get tips and tricks and techniques from Chris Lilly, Darren Worth, Ernest Cervantes, Childs Cridlin. With mouthwatering flavor, 
and no artificial ingredients. Smithfield fresh porks, quite simply, some of the best pork money can buy. Trusted choice of world championship pet champion pitmasters for use at competitions and at home. Why not? Coming out of the bullpen this evening tonight is the chef liaison and unofficial master taster at Certified Angus Beef. He's also the host of the Meat Speak podcast, which is also a Certified Angus Beef production. Let's race to the hotline and welcome in first timer to the show, Brian Schaff. Hey, Brian. Hey, hey. What up? How you doing? Uh, Man, I am living the dream about about an hour south of you. Actually, this is not this is not a, a, a hardly a long distance telephone call. No, not a long distance call, but from the uh, odd uh, divergence of our relationships, it might as well be from like North America to Antarctica for crying out loud! It's unbelievable. Right. Right. I, yeah. I, I feel like I we have just I think we we've just missed each other by like eight seven inch at different yeah. events and and it's it's just amazing that we hadn't crossed paths earlier uh, really until our pal Jeremy Umansky, uh got us on the horn. That's right. The uh, the Koji yeah. Alchemist uh, Jeremy Umansky, owner of Larder, which I highly tout on this show whenever I get the chance, of course. So uh, I appreciate you being able to jump in here on kind of short notice. Um, uh, before we get into certified Angus beef stuff and learning a little bit about you, I've been asking all my guests as we lead off. Uh, Friday, September 11th, obviously, the 19th anniversary of the terror attacks here in this country. So as you look back uh, 19 years ago as we approach Friday, some of your thoughts on you know how you saw it uh, back in 2001 and uh, where we are now. Yeah, you know, it's 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 one of those things I think to this day it is still it's surreal. I think for our generation it was, you know, it was the it was our 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 John Kennedy assassination. It was you know, we were alive during the Challenger, but I think I was I was 8 years old when the Challenger uh, happened. And so, yeah, I mean 2001 was one of the, I remember I was I was sitting in class at Ashland University and uh the professor only kind of half knowing what had happened because it had just happened, told us that something had happened in New York City. And as the day kind of progressed and the news came out, it, it just, you know, it was uh, it was one of the few times when I think there was there was real genuine fear for people in this country, not knowing what to expect. And um, it was it was it was to this day, it's one of those things I still have. I played uh, men's soccer at uh, Ashland University. And to this day, I still have. Uh, we had a game that day that got postponed, and when we came back and played it, uh, our uh, equipment manager had actually they'd sewn on American flags onto the sleeves of our of our kits. And to this day, I still have that kit hanging in my closet. And uh, over the years, you know, on the nights that I would be coaching uh, on September 11th, I, w- I would always pull it out um, and just tell the kids kind of about that story. And just, I mean, uh, you know, I hope that future generations don't have to go through that again, but yeah, it's, it, it, what a scary time. No doubt about it. Uh, Brian Schaff joining me here on the show, the chef liaison and unofficial master taster over at certified Angus beast. Appreciate you sharing that story with us, Brian. So let's go ahead and uh, do a little due diligence on you before we get into certified Angus beef and their vision and what they're looking to do with beef. A uh, little professional background on you, and uh, I don't know if you've always been with Certified Angus Beef, but if not, uh, what uh, you had been doing in the past and how your path led you to Certified Angus. Yeah, you know, it's it's kind of strange. I grew up on a on a 200-acre dairy farm uh, in northeast Ohio and, and spent really my first, you know, 20-some years of my life, you know, figuring out how to get off the farm. Um, my background, my degrees, everything is in journalism. I was a writer for a daily newspaper for um, almost a decade. I was a sports writer. Actually, I was I was in the locker room with LeBron James in his rookie year. Nice. Um, you know, you know, covering Indians games, and you know, I stood at the back of the end zone in the final two minutes of Browns games many times. Um, but over time, my my journalistic career shifted, and I ended up um, dealing with business and politics and government, and and that was sort of where I crossed paths with with Certified Angus Beef. Um, uh, there was an opening there. It's a fantastic company. They actually needed, they needed a writer, um, not necessarily anybody with a culinary background, but somebody who, you know, who could, you know, could put some words together. So, uh, yeah, long story short, that's what got me there. Um, 
And then just really over the last decade plus, it's been, you know, you spend enough time working with, with meat science PhDs and, and chefs who have cooked all over the world. You, you, you tend to pick up a thing or two. And uh, I always like to say, I, I'm, I, I know enough to be dangerous, but, but don't mistake me for an expert by, by any means. I hear that. That's like my life mantra every day of the week. Uh, look, there's folks out who know what certified Angus beef is all about and what the vision and mission is, but there are also others who might be a little unclear. For instance, they are at their supermarket or local meat purveyor. They see a steak in the meat case that has a certified Angus beef branding on it, and then there might be one a few next to it without any designation whatsoever, or at least not the CAB designation. So there's potential for potential uh, buyer confusion, as I was just redundant there yeah. for a second. Tell me a little bit about yeah. Certified Angus Beef and how it came to be, and then, of course, what the, the vision and the mission on an everyday basis is as far as the meat world is concerned. Yeah, so, you know, it, it, it's a little confusing, and, and really the, the reason why we exist can also be, I guess, less clear. Um, the easy answer as to, as to why we exist, basically, uh, we were formed in uh, 1978, uh, before 1978, beef was beef was a commodity. Um, there there was a USDA grading scale, but uh, a few years, I believe it was 1976. There had really in the years even before 76, there had been a, a large influx in European continental breeds, which were very lean because in the 70s there was a big thing about the war on fat, um, and a group of Angus producers got together and said, "Hold on here, like, you know, you say what you will about fat. That's that's also what makes." you know, steak delicious. And, you know, Angus cattle have a genetic propensity, as do a couple other breeds, uh, to, to, to deposit marbling very efficiently. Uh, and so that's where they, they laid out uh, basically 10 specs, you know, if, if, if all beef could meet certain criteria based on marbling score and age and sizing and, and yield and things like that, well, that, you know, it's something that basically you could say what's a guarantee that this is going to be to be good it's going to perform for you um and it was it was out of that that certified angus beef came into being um as as a product um you know as as far as why we exist we exist to drive demand for registered angus cattle um and the reason that is is basically we were started by a bunch of angus producers you know and you know angus cows in general they they do have that genetic propensity to to put down marbling um you know as do a few other breeds but you know the the real answer to that is we were started by angus breeders brian chaff joining me here on the show uh certified angus com is the website if you have never been there you might want to check it out here while we're chatting it up a little bit so let's work back to the example i was just talking about brian that i gave a few minutes ago when buying a cut of beef, why would the consumer want to look for or potentially ask their meat purveyor for a CAB branded meat versus something that doesn't have that designation? Yeah. So, I mean, the, the easiest way to answer that is uh, if it has the certified Angus beef logo on it, you, you know what you're getting. And that, you know, there are 10 science-based specs behind it. And what that is, I mean, the most important is that marbling score. It is the top third of choice up into prime. So nothing below that upper echelon of, of cho the choice grade is ever going to get into one of our boxes. And so um, we sort of base ourselves around the idea is, is we're, we'll never go out, we'll never say that you, you can't get a, a great steak or a great eating experience elsewhere from another brand, another breed, anything like that. Uh, we really hang our hat on consistency. And it's the idea that if it has our logo on it, you know what you're going to get. And that's why we exist in so many restaurants around the world, you know, because, it, I mean, if you're a chef and you're doing 1,500 covers a day, uh, you know, the, the, the consistency and quality of, of your steak is one less thing you should have to worry about. So just to be clear, this is not a grade of meat like choice, prime, or Wagyu, but you will fit somewhere uh, into those grades as a, a product designation? Yeah, so so if you can think of the, the, the beef grading scale, you know, the our uh you know, one of our specs is a marbling score, which if you look at the, the USDA grading scale, that's all based on marbling score, you know, prime choice select. Um within the choice grade there are actually three different levels of marbling because, you know, we have to make things as complicated as possible. Right. Um, but uh but where we come in is 
it's a little confusing because the, the three levels of marbling just in the choice grade, two thirds of that is made up of the bottom third of choice. Um, so those top two thirds of choice actually make up actual quantity wise about only a third of any beef that's graded choice. Um, and we have set our, our most important spec uh, at a marbling score that would only have those top two thirds of choice. Uh, and the reason that is, is even back in the 70s, meat scientists, including our, one of our founders, Dr. Bob Van Stavern from Ohio State, uh, they had done enough taste sensory panels and realized that that line between uh, in the choice grade is where the palate, the, the average palate can tell a discernible difference between the taste of, of, you know, this tastes better than this. And so that's why we drew our line right there as opposed to at the bottom of choice um, was because of, of those taste panels, you know. And so if, if you're going to just buy low choice, you know, all meat scientists would, would suggest that you might as well buy select because the, the, the average palate isn't going to notice that difference. Um, so that's, that's, where, that's why we've drawn our, our baseline uh, for where certified English beef starts is, is at that top of choice. Um, and so if you do see our logo on it, you're getting something in that top tier of choice up into prime. And honestly, um, you know, some of the cattle raised around here in Ohio hit prime plus, or, yep. you know, we kind of refer to it internally as super prime. I mean, it's, they almost look like, you know, they, they, they would fall on the Wagyu scale. So. <laughs> Brian, 2020 has obviously been a year like few of us have ever been involved with. Now, for a lot of folks in the live fire industry, it has been one of the most, if not the most successful year that they have uh, perhaps experienced even in the uh, duration of their business's life. For other folks uh, in the food service side and things of this nature, it's obviously been uh, quite the opposite side of that spectrum. So what's it like at Certified Angus Beef during this coronavirus time? You know, it's uh, it, it, it's been hard, and it's it's one of those things where uh, you know we're we're impacted uh, to a to a degree, uh, to a same degree. We're fortunate in the way that we're set up as a as a business model, in that you can get certified Angus beef in restaurants and retail. Um, as long as people are eating, people are buying certified Angus beef. We can look back even through you know the the recession and you know, the, the late 2000s, um, you know, people continue, maybe they ate less beef on the whole, but when they were eating beef, you know, they, they were getting the higher quality stuff. Um, so we've been fortunate to at least have a little bit of insulation. Uh, by no means does that mean, you know, we've, we've skated through any of this by any stretch, but, uh, you know, we've, we've, had, we've had retail partners who have just, I mean, been struggling to keep up with the demand. Uh, especially during uh, you know during the early stages of the shutdown, and, and we've had some of our our closest chef friends, restaurant owners, um, you know we we we've seen them go through the probably the worst time that most of them have ever seen in their careers. So um, it's a really strange time. It's it's also a time when I think you see the the best um, in uh, in humanity, the way people come together, the way people help each other. You know, just in Cleveland, some mutual friends of ours. You know, as as restaurants shut down. Um, you know, Cleveland Family Meal, led by Vinny Semino, who used to be at Greenhouse Tavern. Mm -hmm. um, you know, they they were they were they were cooking up food every single day and feeding restaurant folks for free uh, for for months. Um, it just you know, it's one of those things. It's uh, it's it's not a good. Uh, it's certainly nothing you'd ever wish on anybody. But man, there really are some uh, some real feel good moments that come out of hard times. Brian Schaff joining me here on the show. Brian, Meat Speak podcast gearing up for season two launch at the end of the month. In your opinion, what are the wins for the Certified Angus Beef brand to launch and then have and run their own podcast? Yeah, it's it's uh, it's kind of a uh, um, kind of two pronged. One. Um, somebody that that I, I really hope uh, the 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 greater uh, the greater uh, industry gets to meet and actually somebody who's a great friend of your, your previous guest, Jess Pryles, our, our meat scientist, Diana Clark um, is just, just a wealth of knowledge and information. And um, to be able to give her 
um, a medium to, to talk about meat science and talk about the, the hows and the whys. And, and honestly, if you're running a, a, a restaurant operation, you know, what are some different ways to cut things? What are some different cuts uh, that are great alternatives that, that will, will maybe, you know, improve your bottom line, especially during times like this? Um, she's just such a fascinating, fascinating personality. Uh, so uh, to, to, to put her on and really spend a lot of time diving into meat science um, in the inner workings of, you know, dry aging science and, um, you know, making charcuterie and sausages and, and all kinds of things like that. Um, you know, all, all I am is the guy who sort of runs the, the board and, you know, makes really terrible jokes. But uh, Diana and, uh, and our, our other chef uh, and co-host chef Tony Biggs is our director of culinary. And he's, he came to Worcester, Ohio. He was the executive chef to the king and queen of Jordan in the wow. Middle East before coming here, which is a logical career progression, of course, going from cooking for royalty to Worcester, Ohio. <laughs> Makes sense. No <laughs> doubt. Yeah, you know. <laughs> but he was an American, and it was a chance to get back over here. And uh, um, Tony, Tony's, he's, he's been all over the world. He was in Mel Marcos, his chef. He uh, ran the Second Harvest Food Bank in, in New Orleans post-Hurricane Katrina. Wow. You know, he ran the Tokyo American Club over in Japan. I mean, the guy's just been all over. Uh, and so between the two of them, uh, there's, 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 there's just so many stories and ideas and information that it's just a great way to disseminate that. And then the other side is, is because we're certified in this beef, because, you know, you know, we, we kind of started small, but, you know, we're, we're everywhere. You know, we're all around the world. We, we have a lot of really interesting friends and we thought it was kind of an opportunity or an avenue to to tell some of their stories as well um including you know we had uh, we had you had our pal jeremy Umansky on uh, near the end of season one and uh, we've got a, a whole bunch of new folks lined up for uh for season two so you know it's an opportunity to to really kind of tell their story how they got to do what they're doing and and honestly that there are folks doing really interesting things with really interesting cuts and you know if, if you're a chef or if you're a meathead out there uh and you've never really thought about different ways of cooking a beef shank whole um you know there, there might be an application for it and, and we might have somebody who's already doing it who uh who you could glean some information from Certified AngusBeef.com is the website. You can get the podcast from that website as well, so make sure that you subscribe to it. It's on Spotify, all the other podcast platforms, and Brian Schoff is the host, as he had just mentioned, cracking the high-level jokes. Uh, you can find out more by visiting that website, and in the meantime, follow them on social media and all the other places. Brian, really appreciate the time this evening to look into Certified Angus Beef, and uh, we'll stay in touch. Let's do it again soon. Man, looking forward to it. Let me know. Uh, where our, our meat lab is under construction right now from some, some COVID issues, but uh, as soon as it's back up, please, 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 we'd love to have you down to break down a cider beef or two. All right, we'll do it. Thanks again. There he is, Brian Shaw from Certified Angus Beef. How convenient that the uh, pen is to shut down by Corona. I can't catch a break. An hour away, and it's like it might as well be a world away. We're go I feel like we got some bridges going in the right direction, like ships in the night just barely missing each other. Hey, uh, let me talk to you quickly about Southside Market before we run out of time this evening. Established in 1882, the oldest barbecue joint in Texas, four locations, three locations to choose from. Run by the same family for three generations. Known for the original beef sausage, of course, but they're also cooking great prime briskets that are smoked low and slow for many hours over real Texas post oak wood. Shop at southsidemarket.com where you can get all of their great and wonderful stuff. Shipping to customers. When you're doing that, you can choose to ship now or you can do shipping later. You can include a custom gift note. You can mail to multiple addresses without any additional charges. All shipped items are vacuumed sealed to ensure freshness and ease of preparation for the customer. On-site meat market for fresh and smoked products. Custom orders are welcome. They do private labeling as well if you're interested in that. Elgin, Texas has the original restaurant since, uh, since 1882. Bastrop, Texas since 2014. There's also one in Austin, Texas. Grocery distribution through Texas and many surrounding states as well when you're on southsidemarket.com. 
Use promo code BBQ Central, all one word, lowercase. That's promo code BBQ Central. And get 10% off each and every order when you're at SouthsideMarket.com. We're back to wrap the show. Stick around. We'll be right back. Whole packers, full racks, legs and thighs, injecting butts. If you've never heard this before, you might think you found the best triple X show ever. Let's get back to the most homoerotic host out there today, Craig Rimpy. Hey, welcome back. This portion of the show brought to you by the Smoke Sheet. Go to bbqnewsletter.com and sign up for a great all-in-one resource covering the live fire industry. Also, this has nothing to do with me. The longest-running embedded correspondent, Doug Shiding from Texas, appeared on the Baseball and Barbecue podcast hosted by Loyal Centralite. Jeff, 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 just hold on a goddamn minute, please. I said wait. A minute. Holy Christ. Everybody's so anxious these days. Anyway, this podcast hosted by loyal centralite Leonard Aberman. Len, top of the eve. If you're looking for Doug's episode, it's episode 69. So check out Doug being a guest, doing great things, talking baseball, talking barbecue on the Baseball and Barbecue Podcast. In addition to Doug, there's also a great interview with somebody named John Shea, and he has written a book about Willie May. So if you like barbecue and you like baseball, look for episode 69 with our very own Texas Embedded correspondent, Doug Scheider. And now we can. Hi, this is Jeff Stone of Grandpa's Pride Barbecue from the Panhandle of Florida, and you are listening to the Barbecue Central Show. <laughs> 